Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Real Influencers Project. I'm your host, Craig Reynolds. Mainly, this show covers a lot of former BMX racers, whether they're legends or in the Hall of Fame or, you know, all kinds of really interesting people that ride on two wheels. However, I also like to speak with entrepreneurs and people that I know from back in the day as well. So um, today is going to be a very special chat with one of my favorite people. Please welcome Ms. Meg Seitz. Meg, how are you? I'm good, Craig. How are you? I'm doing very, very well. Thank you. I was you. listening to that intro about BMX racers and I was like, oh gosh, don't quiz me about that. Cause I, <laughs> you're the expert there. I am total novice. Not even, you know, this is all about you. This is all about you. This isn't about the racers. Um, okay, I, good. I think when we think about, you know, influencers these days, we talk about people that are on social media selling stuff to people. Um, yeah. but for me, the influencers are the people that we, that helped us as we were growing up that have helped us in our life. People that have actually touched us and had conversations with us, not the people that you see online that you want to live that lifestyle, but how do you improve your own lifestyle? And to me, that's talking to my neighbors and, and my parents and my friends, those are my influences. And those are the people that have really helped me become who I am. That's the beauty of this show is that it covers everybody, whether you're a BMXer, an entrepreneur, um, you know, a, a musician, everyone's got a story. And I love the stories behind the stories. Mm -hmm. um, so that being said, give me a little bit background about yourself. Uh, where did you grow up? Oh, OK. So I actually grew up all over the country. Um, my, I was born in Philadelphia. And then consequently, we moved to Long Island, New York, and back to Philadelphia, and then Chicago, yes. Plano, Texas, which is a oh suburb God. of Dallas, uh -huh. um, and then Pittsburgh. And then I went to college in Ohio, small school called Kenyon College, um, and then moved back to Pittsburgh, and then moved to Charlotte. And I have now been in Charlotte for 13 years. Wow. Um, what year did you so, get here? What? What year did you get here? Uh, 2007. So it's probably, it. yeah, it's definitely been probably, fi it's 15 years at this point, Craig. Right. Oh my Long God. Time. Why, why, why did you guys move around so much? Military or what was the idea? Yeah. So um, my parents are both native Pittsburghers. They are, they actually are they both are probably second or third generation Pittsburghers. They actually grew up with their houses right behind each other. Um, and I think one of the things that was really important to my dad when they were having their own family was because they had grown up in Pittsburgh, because they have lived, they'd lived in the same house for the majority of their, both of their lives. My dad was a really strong advocate for making sure that when a job opportunity, when a promotion, when a move came up, that they took it. Um, and as a result, my sister and I had a very different childhood than, than both of my parents who were very um, comfortable and safe. And, you know, they had their world in Pittsburgh. We, on the other hand, were moving constantly. And so I think between kindergarten and eighth grade, I think I was in four different schools, um, four or five different schools. So we moved around a lot. My my dad was in sales. And so every opportunity that came up, he took it and he said yes. And so as a result, we moved around the country a lot. You got to see a lot. You yeah. got to experience a lot. Um, how do you feel that has helped you today with all of that variety and that change that took place for you? And has it been tough being in Charlotte for 15 years? And yeah. Not moving? Yeah. You know, growing up, I hated moving, you know, because you hate being the new kid. Nobody likes being the new kid. And so I really, I don't, you know, I didn't resent it, but it was always kind of tough. Like it's tough being the new girl. And I have seen, though, that as an adult, it made me a lot more comfortable with change. It made me a lot more comfortable meeting new people or trying new things. Um, and so even though I've been in Charlotte now for 15 years, you know this, I've had several different jobs in several different industries. I have moved within Charlotte several times. Um, 
I've changed friends circles. I've met new people. Like there's been, you know, I've been in the same place, but you know, I, I feel like I got really comfortable with change as a kid. And so now it's, if there's not some change coming up, I'm kind of itching for it at this point. And so I think, I think that's what, you know, at the time it was so frustrating as a kid, but it really prepared me so well for change as an adult, especially, obviously we were just talking about this, the change even over the last couple of years of just like being really agile and flexible and just going with the flow. (laughs) Do you ever think with, with all that adjustment and changing careers and um, do you ever look back and think, wow, oh, had I stayed at that job, I could have been, I could have been a district manager by now or something. Has there ever been a time when you thought back and gone, oh man, I should have hung onto that one? No, I don't ever. Think- <laughs> do I? I don't ever think that. Um, I think every job that I've left, I've been ready to go. I feel like I've either reached a point you never stop growing, but I think you can stop growing within certain roles or teams. Sure. And so I think all of the jobs that I have left and moved on to another role, like I was ready. Um, I was really, I was really ready. If anything, I might have stayed too long at the party sometimes. You know, you always think like, oh, I'll get through another year, or I'll give it another six months. And I really, there aren't any roles that I think of that I'm like, I wish I had stuck it out a little bit longer because every new job, it's been new opportunity, new growth, new people. And so I think that's, for me, that's kind of been the moving that I got used to as a kid. Yeah. Not once have I stepped step and thought to myself, oh man, I wish I'd worked Black Friday last year. That would have been great. I would no. never say that. No, no. Not a chance. Not, a, Not chance. a chance. Yeah, I think everything has a season. And I think at the time, you know, I, I was really happy in certain roles at that time in my life, whether it was an age thing or maturity thing. But I don't really look at things and I'm like, I, I could never really see myself in a role for like 15 years. Like that would be bananas. I think that's a generational thing, though, too. I think the older generations tended to stay in jobs for a lifetime. And uh, I remember my first job, my first real, real job was I taught 12th grade. And I was like, I, you know, I enjoyed it. I taught for three years. I burned out because I was, you know, young and hungry. And I, you know, it just burned out. And I kept thinking, I was like, I don't know that I could see myself teaching the way certain teachers teach for 10, 15, 20. I mean, even longer than that. I, that just wasn't the way I, that's not the way I wanted to structure my career. Right. Now, I watched my dad work for 33 years at Wayne Hummer and Company as a stockbroker. Learned a mm. killer work ethic from that. Right. I watched that all happen. Um, but man, I couldn't do it. There's no way. You yeah. said it. I, I couldn't stay in the same place for that long. I raced bikes for 23 years. And that's it. Like what I learned there and the agility that I learned from racing and, and not being always the most, I don't know, secure with the contracts at the end of the year, because you never know yeah. if they could pull those contracts in the heartbeat. Yeah. Um, you have to be agile and be ready to, to make a move at any point. Um, yeah. When you have kids, it's a little different. It's a little, a little more nerve wracking living like that. But you know what? I, I just, yeah. it's what I know. Right. It's what I know. I, know. I, feel, I, I feel the same way. I mean, even watching my dad's career as we were growing up, it's like anytime there was a new opportunity or a shift or, you know, new team, he, he took that opportunity and ran with it. So I feel like there's a part of him in the way I've, I've decided to go about my career too, because you just gotta, it just always has, to, you have to keep changing and growing and trying new things. Right. Yeah. I think if had you and I both stayed at Lululemon from the, from the jump off, I don't know what we'd be doing right now. I, can't, I don't know. I can't even imagine. I can't imagine. I can't, no, I can't even imagine. I mean, even in the time that I was there, and I was there for, I guess, three years, two, three years, there right. was such change. And, you know, it, obviously they were a young, growing company, but I can't right. even imagine what that would look like now. I don't have a clue. Not a clue. I'm yeah. glad I'm not there. I think uh, everything that's happened since then has been very good for me and my family. Um, yeah. And it seems like everything that's happened for you has been fantastic as well because you've started your own business. I did. Yeah, I uh, I started my own business in I 
Well, I had started it probably about two years before I took it full time. I did the, the side hustle for about a year and a half, two years. And then I took my company full time in 2015. So we are going on the seven year mark this year, which is really exciting, especially as a female owned business who has survived and thrived in a pandemic to make seven years. It's um, I mean, it's definitely been a journey, but we are here and I'm proud to say that I'm entrepreneur and business owner and all the things. Now. So tell me about how that came about. Like, what was the influence behind starting it? And what exactly is it that you do? Yeah. So I started, well, just to kind of give you some background on and my career, um, I went to college and I majored in English. I was always somebody that really loved reading and writing and thinking in that world. Um, And when you graduate with an English degree, I feel like you're coached to become a teacher (laughs) or work in a library or, you know, something along those lines. And I don't know, I really kind of struggled out of college. I wasn't entirely sure what I wanted to do or where I wanted to be. And I took a teaching job and that was really my way of learning how to navigate a professional environment, but I could also explore the reading and the writing and the thinking through teaching. You know, I was teaching some of these books and stories that I had, I had been taught and I had read through school. And so I think that was, that was a very, I want to say it was a very creative job. Um, You don't necessarily think so initially, but that was kind of like my dose of creativity but there was a part of me that loved business too. And so this kind of was the beginning of my, one of my inner struggles of, am I an English person or am I a business person? Because I think the world coaches you that you've got to be one or the other. Right. And I could see paths in both fields. And I, I was really struggling to navigate that. And I ended up leaving teaching to work for Lululemon. One of my favorite parts of Lululemon was the branding and the brand strategy and teaching people, again, teaching being a major theme in my life and career, teaching people about the brand strategy and the decisions as to why we did certain things, why we said certain things, how we approached um, guests, um, and just some of that like overall brand approach. I loved that. I ended up... um, you know, I wasn't really sure where that was going to go, to be honest. I was like, I don't, I just, I don't know where I'm going to go with Lululemon. I wasn't going to move to Vancouver. Um, And so I kind of felt like, you know, I was unsure. So what I ended up doing is I applied to business school and I got in and um, I went to Wake Forest University um, for my MBA. It was at that it was during that program, Craig, that I was really aware of the fact that people who were great with numbers, and this is a gross generalization, I'll say this. Sure. People who were really great with numbers, who loved the pivot tables and the spreadsheets and all the things, <laughs> actually needed a lot of support when it came to storytelling and writing and creativity and creative thought as well. Um, I remember specifically, there was one kind of like a fake pitch in one of our classes. And the guys, the group of guys get up there and they're like walking us through these like spreadsheets. And I was like, I just, as much, I'm sure these numbers are correct. I'm sure they're amazing. But at the end of the day, we're sold on the story of it. And we're sold on, you know, that like great word choice or that hook sentence or like the really good question that we ask somebody else. And it was at that point that I started to see that there was a place where the creative world and the language world and the storytelling world could support business and vice versa, that they needed each other. And there needed to be a middle path between both. So um, I graduated from business school, took a, like a nine to five job and started building my business on the side. Did it for two years before then taking it full time. And, and I got to say, like, I took it full. I took it full time. Um, you know, as much as you, you know, you can go to business school. No one teaches you how to run a business in business school. One of the like great ironies is that no one teaches you how to run a business. And so I remember Googling like how to 
organize a business, you know, like organize it legally and within the state, within the government. And because I, I didn't know anything about that. So I uh, actually at the beginning Wait, of they didn't teach you about tax ID numbers and anything oh, no. and all oh, the no. what? No, they teach you how to manage business. But there was no real like there was one semester of entrepreneurship who was which was taught by just like you know, one of the craziest professors. He was an adjunct professor and had just had his totally own style. But yeah, there was no instruction on like how to run your own business, which is, you know, ironic. But um in early 2015, I was forming this company. I gave myself like six weeks. I gave notice at work and I gave six weeks notice. I was going to be leaving in middle of February. And so um, I gave myself that runway of six weeks. I I did not have a lot of money saved up. I had, you know, a couple of thousand bucks, not anything more than 5,000 bucks saved at all. And was like, I'm just going to do it. And had enough clients to like pay the bills but didn't really have a plan for like health insurance was, I mean, I was definitely like amateur entrepreneur at that point and just figured a lot of this out on my own. And thank goodness I never like broke a bone or got into a car accident or anything like that. Uh Um, But really like hit the ground running and like hustled really hard, got health insurance, like, you just figure out all of these things along the way, but there was no, there was no manual. There was no instruction book um, and really started chipping away and, and building clients and building a reputation. And um, it's been seven years. And so what I'll say too, for the question of what we do. So that has evolved over time as well. And yeah. So when I started, Um, I was doing a lot of social media management. And at the time, I mean, this seems like a millennium ago, but like seven years ago, there was no Instagram. It was Facebook and Twitter. And so I was helping some personal brands and small businesses in Charlotte just manage their, honestly manage their Facebook posts and their, their tweets. And it was something that was like kind of easy to do. It was fun. It was you know, of course I was like seven years younger. And so it's like, it's fun to be on, you know, at the time it was fun to be on those channels. And that's really what got it started because people, A, didn't want to do it. And B, they didn't know what to say. You know, like, what do I post? What do I write? Mm -hmm. How do I say it? And that's really been the through line to my work now is helping people figure out what to write, what to say. And how to do it in a way that sounds like them. Mm -hmm. So I will say today, what we do is I, I use the expression that we're a thought partner first. And so what we do is we think with people, we do a lot of um, creative brainstorming sessions. We do a lot of brand discovery sessions, really getting to know people and, and businesses and brands so that we can figure out how we can craft messaging that sounds like them and makes them feel confident and clear when they put themselves out there in the world. Because ultimately what I want them to do is be able to sell themselves and sell their products and services in a way that is reflective of who they are, but then also is reflective of their own brand promise too. Because sometimes you read copy and you're like, you hear one thing and then you talk to them on the phone and it's like a totally different story. So I think for us, it's trying to figure out how we can be as clear and succinct as possible, but also as authentic as possible too. Because in the age of technology, sounding like a human is actually a, a skill. So, um, so we support, as you can imagine, we support in a lot of marketing, um, storytelling, editorial, public relations, communication projects, really anything that anyone needs help figuring out how to say it or write it and then actually getting it out there in the world. Do you find that you're working with a lot of your clients and helping them with their advertising campaigns and making sure that that sounds just like their voice and sounds exactly like it should and looks like it should as well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, 
I will say that naturally when you're when you're crafting messaging or copy for a website, it's going to end up somewhere else in the world, whether it's a billboard, whether it's a social media caption, it's going to show up somewhere in the world. So I think for us, it's how do we craft this in a way that it's going to make sense to any eyeballs, wherever they're going to see it in whatever advertising capacity. But then also to your point, making sure that the visuals and the copy support each other. Mm -hmm. So we work with a lot of photographers, brand designers, website designers, artists, creative thinkers um, who are crafting the artwork so that the copy and the story and the words support the visuals and vice versa. Because when you have both of those camps working in a silo, like you're going to get two different things. And if they're at least working together, you can get one powerful punch versus two separate punches. Right. Yeah, Cause I think no matter how much you try to describe it to somebody, it's going to seem a little different from someone else. They're yeah. going to translate it a little bit different in their mind. And their that image is going to look different than the copy that needs to go out. How do you make sure that that voice is consistent though? If you guys are the ones that are helping them manifest what it should say, how does it still come off as their message? Yeah, um, I think that what we end up doing, what's really important to our process is when we're getting to know a client, we talk to the founder, the owner, the leadership, but we also talk to whomever is gonna be customer facing too, because we wanna get as many voices to the table to figure out you know, what their voices are and what their their preconceptions are of the brand voice so that we can get a very consistent understanding of that. And a lot of times, Craig, that means telling people the exact words to use Mm. because you know that if you're in a retail environment and you're talking about customers, but the brand talks about them as guests, there's a disconnect, Mm -hmm. not only in language, but also probably the level of service too. Sure. I feel like guests always get a little bit more of like, you know, the judge, the VIP service versus customers kind of has that ring of like getting it out. And so I think in doing so, you know, we really hang our hat on the fact that brands are built with language. Um, and if we can come up with a consistent language and figure out a way to equip team members with those tips and tricks and even the exact words they can feel confident putting the brand out there and in whatever way they show up for the brand, whether it's via email, sales presentations. Um, What comes up a lot, this is actually an important example, is that sometimes brands will hire summer interns for, to manage their social media. (laughs) You know, like who's, who are the most, you know, fun and trendy, but the young folk and they're on Instagram and TikTok and all the things. But what's the the problem with that is that sometimes leadership doesn't share the brand, you know, voice and tone and language guidelines with whoever's managing social. And a lot of times those social channels are the ones that are getting the the most eyeballs and most traction, especially too, if you're actually putting advertising money behind them. So that's a, a really good example of how even having some kind of consistent guide can help whomever it is, whether they are there for the summer or they started the company, there is one language. And I think at that point, the one language is a cultural mindset when it comes to that company, that we are one team with one vision, one mission, and one, um, one story or one, one language guide. Yeah, I think what you said about the customer facing voice mm-hmm. um, and, and picking from them, I, that our retail background how many times have we been like, if they would just listen to what we have to say, it might be different from what they think is going on down here. Um, yeah. That's got to feel really good for those people um, to and empowering for them and feel like they're really part of the company to actually be a part of, of what you're doing to create this voice. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's the other thing too is talking to as many people who are customer facing or people who have been with brands or companies for you know, 10, 15, 20 years, and even those who have just started, like trying to get as many voices to that first table so that we understand what exactly 
like what's working when it comes to language and communication, but then what are the opportunities too, so that then we can all like move forward together. So throughout this time, and you've worked with a variety of different clients, mm-hmm. is there one specific thing that you see time and time again, where you're like, okay, we got to fix this. This is number one on the agenda because I see this everywhere. Whether yeah. it's a branding issue, a voice issue, a communication issue. Yeah. So I'll say my first reply to that is that we use way too many exclamation points. <laughs> I'm going to put that in the video, a bunch of exclamation points on, or on the top of us. Right oh here. my gosh. I feel like sometimes all I do is like edit out the exclamation points and it drives me bananas when I see it on a website too. Cause it's like, are you really that excited about that? Like really? <laughs> <laughs> like, I just think it's one of those things that I think they are a privilege, not a right. So we have to use them appropriately and sparingly. So I will say that that's the big thing is everyone errors on the side of more exclamation points than, than not. Um, The other thing too, is I feel like I see a lot of brands and people going to market with rough drafts. Really? And yeah, I, you know, and, and, There's the sloppy stuff, you know, spelling, punctuation, you grammarly and those kinds of things can fix that. But um, I feel like there are there we haven't thought things through. You know, we are so fast to get something published or get something live that we haven't really taken some time to like just take a step back and look at the thinking. Does this make sense? Does this honor who we are? Does this honor the vision for the future? I think people are under such stress and such panic to to put something up, get that web page out, get that caption out, that they don't really think things through. And And I'm not saying, I don't think this means like holding on something for 20 years, but I think just taking an extra day or having another set of eyeballs or even bringing it to a couple different people to review, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, Mm -hmm. And so that's probably my thing is that um, I see a a lot of published rough drafts. And I say that because I see a lot of long copy, long captions, long paragraphs. And I think that's where the editing process is magical because you can edit something down. You can cut something in half just by having a really good conversation about the thinking but also just getting really clear on like, what's the point of this? Like, what do we need to say? Let's cut the bullshit and let's just say what we need to say. Cause that's another thing too, is like, I feel like a lot of copy can be a lot of BS. And I think that's a call to all of us to be like, is this really what we mean? And if so it's less, not- Less is truly less, more then, right? Yeah. Yeah. And if it's not what we mean, why are we, A, why are we not saying what we mean? And B, how do we get to a place where we can say what we mean? Nice. And have you worked with any individuals as well outside of a company, but has anyone come to you and like, look, I need to work with my own personal brand. Can you help me? Yeah. I mean, I will say too, we've seen a lot of that even within the, like the great resignation of people who are leaving their, their jobs and starting their own companies, moving to a different company. And they need some of these brand assets that are going to help their own, um, their personal brand, whether it's a bio, a resume review, just a strategy for, you know, what they post, if they want to start writing, if they want to start posting on a channel like LinkedIn, like, what do I say? How do I say it? Just helping them shape some of that so that they can get noticed. But then really, I think it's about being known for content that that is important to them and, and making them feel confident that they can share that on a platform and, and they're going to know what to say and how to say it. Excellent. Now, if someone wants to get a hold of you, what is the best way to reach out to you to get your services? Oh my gosh. Uh, well, the best way would probably be to just send me an email. And I think, can you include my email in the show notes or something? Yeah, like yeah, I can put it in there. Yeah. I, can, I'll, I can put it, scroll along. Absolutely. Along Please whatever. feel free to send me an email directly. Um, we have, obviously, what um, what's your email? It's Meg, M-E-G, at Toth Shop, T-O-T-H 
shop, S-H-O-P dot com. Perfect. Okay. Uh, that's probably the best way. Shoot me a note. Tell me you heard this this podcast, this recording, um, and let's talk and we can figure out maybe how we can help you. We have a, we've got a team of really talented thinkers and writers. So I have no doubt that somebody on our team can support. And then I always sit on every project as well. So you're getting multiple voices and visions helping you. I love it. Well, Meg, it has been an absolute pleasure. I know you've got to get ready to go to uh, pick up another call to help somebody out. I'm so grateful, number one, that we met years and years and years and years yeah. and years ago and that we've remained friends. Um, I think what you do is fantastic. And when I saw you had branched out to go do something, I'm like, that is awesome. I'm stoked for her, but I'm glad we finally reconnected again so I could hear the story because this is great. Awesome. Well, thanks for the support, Craig. I just, I can't believe Absolutely. it's been so long since we worked together, but I'm certainly glad that I know. we're back in touch. Absolutely. And let's keep it that yeah. way for sure. Yeah, for so, sure. If you guys like what you're seeing, please make sure that you subscribe right here on YouTube. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, subscribe there as well. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for tuning in. Meg, have a wonderful one. And I will talk with you soon. Awesome. Thanks, Craig.